Good morning. Um, we're excited this morning to be able to start our gospel meeting. And um, I want to introduce Brother Jim Dearman to you and then turn it over to him so he'll have as much time as, as, he, as we can allot him this morning. Appreciate you all meeting in here for combined classes. Uh, Jim and I go way back, but you probably don't want to know about those days. Um, but uh, we've known each other for, I guess, 30 plus years. He, um, he's currently preaching at the White Oaks Congregation in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And uh, hopefully, if you've been paying attention to the announcements we've been making, you're aware of the Good News Today TV program, and hopefully you've seen him on there um, with a number of guest speakers, you know, from time to time, Tom Holland, uh, Glenn Colley, our neighbor back here in the th stone's throw from us, um, James Watkins, and some other well-known speakers. And uh, that's an enjoyable program, very well put together. His wife, uh, Janice, um, did she she make it? She gonna be able to make it? To any? No, she won't make it to be able to meet her. But uh, she's a fine lady. He has three children, um, and of course, as I said, he's been preaching the gospel for about 35 years. And uh, we look forward to the lessons he's prepared for us during this series of meetings together. And um, we'll have a word of prayer to begin our class, and then uh, we'll turn it over to Brother Jim Dearman. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this day that uh, we're able to come together and study your word and to worship. Uh, we're thankful for this day uh, arriving as we've planned for it to have this gospel meeting with Brother Jim Dearman. We pray that you'll give him a uh, good recollection of what he's prepared for us. And we pray that you'll be with us as listeners that will have open hearts and minds. And uh, we will see those things that we need to make uh, changes in our lives and and have the courage to make those changes. We pray, Father, that you'll continue to bless this congregation as we endeavor to do those things that are, are much needed in this community and as we try to reach out through the world through all our mission efforts. And we pray that you'll help us to be strong and to uh, be dedicated to continue those efforts. We're mindful this morning, Father, of many who... Uh, uh, of this congregation who need our prayers, and we pray that as uh, means are being used to bring back their health, they may be effectual, that they might be able to be back uh, with us before too much longer, have their health uh, restored at least uh, to a point where they can be about their business, their regular business. I pray, Father, you can forgive us of our sins as we confess them before you, and we pray that you'll Help us to be able to draw closer to Thee through Thy Word and an understanding of what You've done for us through Your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in His name we pray this morning. Amen. I certainly appreciate the invitation to be a part of this Gospel meeting, and I have uh, certainly been looking forward uh, to being with you. As Jim said, we go back a long ways, back to uh, Memphis days when I was a student at the Memphis School of Preaching, and we played a little basketball uh, together back then in a community uh, league and uh, had some good times going back to the Oak Acres congregation in Memphis. And I was privileged to uh, work with that congregation while I was a student part of the time at Memphis and got some valuable experience uh, there at that time. and. Of course, one of the very fine members who was also the secretary of the at the congregation was Nina Hicks. That's Jim's aunt. And uh, Nina is one of the finest Christian ladies that I have ever met. She is now 91 years old. And uh, she is a faithful member at the White Oak Congregation where I preach. And so we're back together there, reunited, and uh, so delighted to be with her. And uh, this good family, Jim and his family, and Nina... Uh, a great heritage of faithfulness to God and um, a great example and an encouragement to me and to uh, my family uh, as well. And it's a great privilege to be uh, here with you and I want to immediately thank you for your very generous support of the Good News Today uh, television program and if you're not seeing it I hope that uh, you will uh, tune in. I brought some, uh, some cards that we had uh, printed 
for the use by members of the church to give to non-members and others to make them aware of the program in their area. This list uh, the commercial stations, including Huntsville, WAMY, which is uh, uh, Channel 54, and uh, it's on Sunday mornings at 8 o'clock Central Time. And, of course, that means it's on Dish and Direct. If you have Dish or Direct, you see it. I don't know that you'd see it. You wouldn't see it at 54. That's the over-the-air number. But you'd have it on uh, another number as well as uh, on cable. If you have cable, you'd have it on a different number. But nonetheless, it sh uh, should be available uh, throughout the Huntsville area. And, in fact, we have several Bible Correspondence Course students enrolled now from the Huntsville area and um, members there at uh, White Oak work with those and of course as they progress and as there is the need for follow-up study hopefully and hopefully even conversion we will uh, forward those to the congregation uh, uh, here uh, to in your area so that you can um, follow up uh, with those who request studies and so that's the idea obviously is to sow the seed and then to cultivate the soil and to utilize the congregations uh, in uh, the areas where the program is aired in their immediate area uh, to benefit them uh, as well as to benefit the cause of Christ as a whole. And so um, I have several of the cards back in the back. And also, if uh, you're interested in receiving information, updates, uh, we can uh, certainly do that. If you have an email address or even your snail mail address, we can uh, do that. But the congregation here is very generous in their support of good news today and uh, we deeply appreciate that very very much you make possible and there are others who help but uh, you're a big part of making possible the airing of good news today in Huntsville and your area uh, and around and so we appreciate that uh, very very much as Jim mentioned we have a magazine format if you haven't seen the program it is a magazine format with different segments we start with a devotional time and some beautiful singing and scenery and scripture reading and study. And then men like James Watkins and James Boyd and uh, Glenn Colley and, and um, others are a part of that uh, uh, magazine format program that is aired uh, now uh, on various commercial stations, Nashville, Chattanooga, Memphis, Huntsville. Uh, also on the web at our website, you can see the program Right after it airs, it's uh, archived there along with older programs, so you can see uh, the programs there uh, as well. So I appreciate very much uh, your support, and certainly I would be remiss if I didn't begin by thanking you for uh, your prayers and support of, uh, of Good News Today. I look forward to uh, this series of meetings. Uh, you have a beautiful, beautiful facility here, obviously, and a beautiful uh, setting. And um, uh, it is encouraging to see congregations that are sound in the faith, uh, thriving and doing well. And certainly it will be our continual prayer that that will continue to be the case here. And I appreciate you uh, so very, very much. You know, in buildings throughout this land uh, today, uh, there are those uh, meeting who are propagating a doctrine that is perhaps the most prevalent and pervasive doctrine uh, that exists in the religious world today that calls itself Christian. And that doctrine is uh, known as premillennialism. That's a big uh, P word. And this morning in the Bible class, because that doctrine is so pervasive, because it is so prevalent, and because it is so pernicious, it is, uh, it is so false and contrary to the basic teaching of Scripture, and yet it is so prevalent in the denominational uh, world uh, today that I think it behooves us to remind ourselves of something very important about that doctrine. First of all, that it is false, but also that it, it basically blasphemes uh, the deity of Christ and belittles the church for which Christ shed his blood. And so this morning, I'd like for us to look at seven other P words uh, that uh, counter or uh, completely uh, contradict that long P word premillennialism. The most popular form of, of premillennialism is, is called dispensational premillennialism and basically it, it tells us that right now we are in a parenthesis, if you will. We're in a parenthetical situation uh, as uh, those who are uh, in the church age as they would call it. And, of course, their definition of the church would be very different than the biblical definition 
of the church even at that because they would define the church as being comprised of all the denominations in a conglomerate that comprise the church. And that's not the biblical, obviously, definition of the church as the Bible defines it. But beyond that, they would also say that, that the church, as they view it, is an afterthought with God. That is, it is not, never was, plan A, but that it had become plan B when plan A failed. Now, what was plan A? According to the premise of premillennialism, plan A was that Christ would come to this earth initially and that he would establish his kingdom. And by that kingdom, they mean an earthly kingdom where he would reign on an earthly throne, the throne of David. But when he came to earth, he was thwarted in his effort to establish that kingdom, if you can believe that, and you certainly shouldn't and hopefully can't. But that is the premise of premillennialism, that because the Jews rejected Christ when he initially came to earth and he did not anticipate that rejection, that he then had to go with plan B. Plan B being the establishment of the church, the church lasting until such time as he will come again, and when he comes the second time, this time he will establish his kingdom, a literal kingdom, reigning on the throne of David, a literal throne in the literal city of Jerusalem. That's the basic premise of premillennialism. Well, initially that would, to me, spawn a question that would be this. If he failed the first time because the Jews rejected him and thwarted his plan, who is to say he won't fail the second time? How can we be assured he would succeed the second time if he failed the first time? It also strongly suggests, implies clearly, that deity could not accomplish what deity intended to accomplish. That deity intended to come to this earth and establish an earthly kingdom, but could not and did not anticipate the rejection of the Jews, and therefore was not prepared, deity was not prepared for the consequence of that and had to go with another plan. And so that's this parenthesis, they tell us, that we are in now. We are in the parenthetical period of time, which is called the church age, according to them. And when Christ comes again, he this time will establish his earthly kingdom. Of course, all a part of this doctrine is the idea of a rapture, a great tribulation, all of these things, including a thousand-year literal reign of Christ on earth, all of that is tied up in this prevalent doctrine of premillennialism. And I suggest to you that there are those in the denominational world who may not even know they believe that uh, because they, uh, they may not be as aware of it, but if they are part of that denominational body for very long, they will hear this kind of teaching. You know that as well as I. You can't scan the dial on the television uh, uh, set for very long if you run across a religious program and stay there for any length of time, you will not stay there for any length of time until you hear something associated with uh, the uh, signs of the uh, end times, the tribulation, the rapture, uh, all of this is uh, very much a part of uh, denominational uh, teaching today. And so it is uh, vitally important that we understand and appreciate how completely and absolutely false this theory is, and also how pernicious it is and uh, how fatal it is from the standpoint of uh, those who embrace it because of what it says. And that is, it says that the church of our Lord is plan B, that it was never God's intention to establish the church, but his intention to establish an earthly kingdom and the church simply came into being when the first plan failed. Now that briefly is the premise of the most popular form of premillennialism, uh, that is the dispensational premillennial uh, doctrine, and we're in that uh, next to last period now of these seven ages or dispensations that they uh, have uh, concocted, and literally that's what they have, have done. What does the Bible have to say? What can we do to help those who may be caught up in this or not even realize that they're a part of a religious body that teaches something that is so contrary to the teaching of, of God's will? Let me suggest seven other P words that will help us to help others, hopefully, 
to see that this doctrine that permeates the denominational world today is false to its core. And really, any one of these seven P words would do the job. That is, any one of these seven words would, um, would offset this doctrine, but we'll put seven together. Seven is, of course, a complete number in Scripture. You'll see the number seven quite often in Scripture, and it is the sacred number or the number that represents completion or perfection or wholeness. And so I believe that when you see these seven uh, P words, you'll see that we have a complete refutation, a complete refutation of this doctrine. First of all, the church and the kingdom are one and the same. And that's part of the uh, preliminary information we need to appreciate, that the church and the kingdom are not two separate institutions, never have been, never will be. There is an eternal phase of the kingdom into which we have not yet entered, into which we hope to enter when this life is over, but it is not a different kingdom. It is still the same kingdom that exists today, and that kingdom is the church, and the church is the kingdom. And we need to understand and appreciate that even before we get to our first, uh, our first P word, but we'll come back to it with some emphasis. But uh, in Matthew 16, 18, and 19, a passage to which we'll return in just a few moments, Jesus said, after Peter made that great confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, he said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you, you're Peter, and upon this rock, not Peter the rock, as some have mistakenly contended, because Peter means a little stone, and the rock, the word for rock there, is a great bedrock. The two words are not even the same in terms of their gender. Uh, they're different in gender, and so he can't be referring to Peter when he said, upon this rock. He's referring to the truth that Peter had just confessed. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Upon this great truth, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Then he says, and I will give to you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now notice, I will build my church, and I'll give to you, and the other apostles were involved too, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Build my church, give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Was he saying, I will build my church, meaning one thing, and I'll give to you the keys to something else, meaning the kingdom of heaven? Well, certainly not. It is a synonym, obviously. Kingdom of heaven is a synonym for church. Kingdom of God, the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. The kingdom is used in a synonymous fashion with the church, and we're very familiar with the use of synonyms. We should be. We use them all the time, don't we? If... Um, if Jim, who's a nice fella, uh, was asked by me, Jim, I am really pushed for time. My, uh, my car is way overdue for an oil change. Could you uh, drop my car off and I'll pick it up later and uh, have the oil changed? Uh, and he said, well, sure, I'll drop it off for you. And then I give him the keys and I say to him, now, Jim, here are the keys to my automobile so that you can drop my car off to have the oil changed. And if he looked at me funny and said, I'm confused, Jim, you said you want me to take the keys to your automobile and get the oil changed, but now you're trying to give me the keys to your car. Which is it, the automobile or the car you want me to take? And I'd say, neither one. I don't want you driving my car if you don't know the difference. <laughs> I don't want you driving it if you don't know that a car and an automobile are the same thing. I'll just take it myself later. We know, obviously, that we use synonyms all the time. Well, the Lord did the same thing when He said, Upon this rock I will build my church... And I'll give to you the keys to the church, to the kingdom of heaven. And so the church and the kingdom are one and the same. But our first P word about this church, this kingdom, is that it was planned. And if it indeed was planned, how could it be plan B? If it was a planned institution, how can it be an afterthought? When you go back to Genesis chapter 3... After sin first entered the world, and the Lord God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, it shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. What was he alluding to? He was alluding to the sacrificial death of Christ, through which the head of Satan would be bruised or given a fatal blow, while only the heel of the Savior would be affected. That is a minor blow compared to the fatal blow 
which Satan would be dealt by the crucifixion of Christ, his death, his burial, and of course his resurrection, without which there could be no ultimate victory. But he was alluding to a plan, obviously, that was being set in motion even at that time. A plan that would culminate in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, through which Satan would be defeated after Satan had introduced sin into the garden through Adam and through Eve. And then if you go to Acts 20 and verse 28, there you have the Apostle Paul addressing the Ephesian elders as he called them to him at Miletus there and charged them to do what? Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd, as the New King James says, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. The church which was purchased with his own blood blood. Genesis 3.15 refers to that blood that would ultimately be shed. What would the shedding of that blood do? Purchase the what? The church. Therefore, the plan was set in motion back in the garden long ago, the plan that culminated in Christ and the shedding of His blood. If we had any doubt about that, we go to Ephesians chapter 3 and look at verses 8 through 11. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, Paul writes, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages, from the beginning of the ages, what ages? The patriarchal, the mosaic, and then finally the Christian age. From the beginning of the ages, before the patriarchal uh, age was ended, before the mosaic age began, God set in motion what? This mystery that is something unrevealed, not something that cannot be known. That's not what the Bible means by mystery, as we think of mystery oftentimes. Mystery, biblically speaking, is just that which has yet to be revealed. It had not yet been revealed. So now, the mystery that has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, then what? To the intent that when? Now, Paul writes, now the manifold wisdom of God might be known, made known by what? By the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Now listen to verse 11. According to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. According to the eternal purpose. Back before the beginning of the ages, then at the time that sin entered the world, we are told in Genesis 3.15, a plan was set in motion then that culminated in what? In Christ and the what? Church. That the manifold wisdom of God might be known by what? By the church. How can the church be plan B if God intended all along for it to be plan A and that His manifold wisdom would be known by the church? How could it possibly be an afterthought with God? How could it possibly be a parenthetical period now in which we find ourselves in what the premillennialists call the church age? It's an impossibility. Therefore, as I said, that one P word would do the job, wouldn't it, in countering premillennialism. But what about a second P word? What about prophecy? What about the church being in prophecy? If I can find the church in prophecy, prophecy, the church being the kingdom, then obviously the prophets were foretelling a time when not plan B would be effected because supposedly deity didn't even know that plan A wasn't going to work. So how could the prophets talk about plan B if plan B is indeed plan B? They'd be having to talk about plan A, which would be what? An earthly kingdom, according to the premillennialists. But what do the prophets prophesy concerning? They prophesy concerning the church. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, tell us that in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountain, shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways, and we will walk in His paths. For what? For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Can you tell me when something like that happened? Indeed, in Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, there is when the law went from Zion, Jerusalem, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, Mount Zion, 
and from Jerusalem. And then, if we look at the book of Daniel, one of the great prophecies of the kingdom is in Daniel chapter 2. Remember that great uh, dream that Nebuchadnezzar had that no one could interpret. Then they called Daniel, and Daniel came. And Daniel was able to uh, reveal to him the dream by the power of God, obviously. And in so doing, he talked about this image that Nebuchadnezzar had seen in his dream, uh, the various uh, materials, the image his head of gold, the chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And down at verse, uh, uh, down at verse 38, uh, or verse 41, beginning, Whereas you saw the feet, partly the potter's clay, the kingdom shall be divided, death the strength of the iron, and so forth. Then he comes down as he continues to interpret, and he comes to the latter part, the iron mixed with ceramic clay. They will mingle with the seed of men, verse 43, but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. That's the kingdom, the fourth kingdom in the image. Fourth kingdom being what empire? The Roman Empire the Roman kingdom. No question whatsoever about the fact that Babylon, the Medes and Persians, the Grecian Empire, and then the Roman Empire were in view in Daniel's interpretation of the dream. And it was in that fourth empire that Daniel said, the days in the days of these kings, the Roman kings, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom in the days of what? The Roman kings. He'll set up the kingdom when? Then, in the days of the Roman Empire. That shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. What kind of kingdom would that be? The kind that Jesus described when he stood before Pilate and said, My kingdom is not of this world. John eighteen thirty six. You know... That statement in itself ought to tell people an awful lot, shouldn't it? When Jesus stood before Pilate and said, My kingdom is not of this world, he was saying, My kingdom is the fulfillment of the kingdom that Daniel prophesied about, that Isaiah prophesied about, that so many of the prophets told about. My kingdom is not of this world. If, I, if it were, I'd, I'd fight and defend it. But it's not of this world. Now let me tell you how deep-seated prejudice can become among those who believe that the kingdom is an earthly, worldly kingdom. I remember before I became the preacher at White Oak, I remember attending a lectureship at White Oak in Chattanooga many years ago and hearing one of the speakers tell an incident in his own personal experience where he had been talking with a premillennialist about the nature of the kingdom. And in talking with this premillennialist, he was trying to convince him that the kingdom is not an earthly, literal kingdom. And he cited John 18, 36. And he said, here Jesus stood before Pilate and said, my kingdom is not of this world. And you know what the response from the premillennialist was? But it is. That was his response. But it is. Jesus said it's not. The response of this premillennialist was, but it is. Jesus said, no, but I say it is. In effect, that's what he was saying. That's how deeply seated prejudice can become. So the kingdom about which the prophets prophesied was a spiritual kingdom. And incidentally, if we stay here in Daniel, Daniel prophesies about the very point in time when Christ received that kingdom and became king over that kingdom. When was it? It was at his ascension. As he went back to the Father in heaven, he was given that kingdom with all authority, and he still has all of that authority, even to this point in time, and he'll have all that authority until time is no more, when what? 1 Corinthians 15, 24, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to the Father, when he puts an end to all rule, all authority, and all power, which means he has all rule, all authority, and all power now, and when was that authority and power given to him? when he ascended to the Father. Daniel prophesied about that very time. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom 
that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Daniel spoke of the very time that Christ would ascend to the Father, the Ancient of Days, one like the Son of Man would be given what? A kingdom. Now, incidentally, what does that say about Daniel and what he wrote? It says he couldn't have written that except by the inspiration of God, which says that what I hold in my hand is inspired of God. And I, I understand fully that there are people in the world today, perhaps more than ever in our lifetime, who are saying this is anything but the Word of God, but it proves itself to be the Word of God time and time again, and one of the greatest proofs there is is prophecy. And it is undeniable. I was made aware recently of a man who had been a practicing atheist for who knows how long, associated with Georgetown, graduate of Georgetown and other universities. He was a practicing atheist. His friends knew him to be a practicing atheist. But he began to take a look at the evidence, and ultimately he said, I could not, could not get around the prophetic element in this book. I had to admit, there is a God, and this is his inspired word. He went from atheism to a belief in God. Tragically, he has obeyed the sinner's prayer form of salvation that is so prevalent in the world today. Hopefully, he'll ultimately study enough to come away from that. But to this point in his journey, at least, he has clearly seen there is undeniable evidence that the Bible is the Word of God. Don't you let anybody tell you otherwise. Young people, especially, and the peer pressure that you're under and the various pressures that you face as a younger generation, you stick with what the Word of God says and the fact that it is the Word of God because the evidence is absolutely overwhelming. I featured a segment on Good News Today recently that hasn't aired yet. We've taped it where there has been, from ABC News, they published a recent on online a study out of Canada that supposedly says that if um, they gave people these analytical mathematical puzzle games of some sort, and they determined that religious people did poorly on these mathematical analytical uh, games, and that therefore those who were better at math and therefore more logical were less likely to believe in God and Scripture and so forth. In other words, if you believe what I'm telling you this morning and what you're told from this pulpit, obviously, uh, every time uh, Brother Orbison stands in this pulpit or anyone else, when you hear that truth, they're telling you that you're, you're buying into that truth based on intuition more than logic, that it's not really logical to be a Christian, that it's much more logical to be an unbeliever if you're truly thinking reasonably. Now, that's the kind of thing we're hearing. It's garbage. It's garbage. There's absolutely no truth to a study like that. I know it's bogus without even delving into the details of it. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, Paul wrote, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a, re a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Reasonable, logical. You can't study this book with an open mind and come away from it with any other conclusion than that this is the Word of God. Now, you can study it with a great deal of prejudice, and you can, uh, you can come away with all sorts of notions, but when you study it the way you should, you'll be convinced, convicted, that this is the Word of God. The evidence is on the side of creation. The evidence is on the side of inspired revelation. The evidence is not on the side of evolution. The evidence is not on the side of what so many are hearing in classrooms across our land today that is being, as being spouted forth as being pure and absolute science. It's propaganda, not science. A little side trip, I suppose, there. But nonetheless, it is indeed prophecy, that is, a P word that offsets. We're going to have to move quickly to get through all our P words here because I'm taking time, but promised. And we've dealt with this. The third P word is promised. Matthew 16, 18. I will build my church. I'll give to you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Church and kingdom, one and the same. Therefore, it was promised by Jesus. And our next P word is that it was presented on Pentecost. Mark 9, 1, Jesus said, There are some of you standing here 
who will not taste of death till you have seen the kingdom of God present, as the New King James says, with power. Some of you standing here will not what? Will not die. Some of those standing with Jesus at the time, he said, you're not going to die till you see the kingdom. Now, one of two things is true. Either the kingdom has come, or there are people still walking around who would make Methuselah look like a newborn baby. And he was 969 years old when he died. Obviously, we know which is true. The kingdom has come. And it came on Pentecost. It was presented on Pentecost. But also, and something vitally important, our next to the last P word is that it was presented with a pattern. It was presented with a pattern. A pattern for its organization, a pattern for its worship, a pattern for its mission, a pattern that was given in every aspect of the church. And that's important because there are some, tragically, even in the church today, who are belittling what they call pattern theology. That pattern theology is something that is non-biblical. That there really isn't a pattern for the church. And they are belittling that pattern, seeking to do away with that pattern. But let me ask you something. Was there a pattern for the for the uh, tabernacle that was first established in the wilderness? Oh, absolutely. Remember, Moses was told, make all things according to the pattern which was shown to you in the mount. Have you ever read through there in the book of Exodus all the specificity, all the details of that, of that tabernacle, the curtains, the I mean, everything you're talking about, specifics. And God said, I want it done just the way I revealed that pattern to Moses in the mount. And Moses then gave it to the people, and they built that tabernacle according to the pattern. Is the tabernacle in any way typical of the church? Well, of course it is. It, it, it is the forerunner. It's the shadow. It's the type of the church. Then you come into the temple period when God's people were settled in the land of Canaan, and they didn't need a tent to move around because they were moving around. The temple was built. David was not allowed to build it because he was a man of war who had shed blood. But the pattern was given to David by the Holy Spirit. And David gave that pattern to Solomon, and Solomon built that temple. Was that typical, temple typical of the church? Of course it was. Now then, we come to the church that was presented on Pentecost, which we've clearly established. And there are those who would tell us that that which was the manifold wisdom of God now made known, as we looked at in Ephesians 3, the institution for which the tabernacle and the temple were mere shadows. Now we come to the real substance. Now we come to the thing God had in mind all along. And they would tell us, now, forget the pattern. Forget the pattern. You do it the way you want to do it. If you want to have cornbread and Coca-Cola on the Lord's table, if you want to bring in an instrument, if you want to do these various things, if that makes you feel good and you feel like you can worship better that way, then do it because there really isn't a pattern to begin with. How much common sense does that make, let alone biblical sense, to say that God would be so specific with the tabernacle, so specific with the temple, that were mere shadows of that which He had in mind, that for which Jesus Christ shed His blood and purchased with His own blood. But now... There is no pattern suddenly. And you do what you want to do. And God says, I'll be happy if you're happy. It makes no common sense. And it certainly is anti-biblical. God is spirit, Jesus told the Samaritan woman. And those who worship Him must worship in spirit, yes, from the heart, sincerely, and in truth. What does it mean to worship in truth? In his prayer to the Father in John 17, Jesus said concerning his apostles, Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. Jesus said worship in truth. Jesus said your, your word, God's word is truth. Therefore, to worship in truth is to worship according to what? The word. Hold the pattern of sound words, Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.13. Hold the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Hold the pattern of sound words. 
What about those on Pentecost right after obeying the gospel? And they continued steadfastly in what? Whatever they wanted to do. That's not what you read. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. You have passage after passage that supports a pattern, a clear pattern for the church. And finally, and very briefly, the seventh and final P word is that because of all these things, the church is precious. The church is precious beyond description. Couldn't possibly be plan B. It's just too, too precious to be plan B. You were not redeemed, Paul, or Peter rather, reminded those to whom he wrote with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was what? Foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. You were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. What did Acts 20, 28 tell us about that blood? That blood, that precious blood purchased the church. Therefore, the church which his precious blood purchased is precious beyond description. And we need to treat her as precious beyond description. One other passage reminds us of that in Paul's great Ephesian letter, which exalts the church as the body of Christ, as the building of Christ, as the bride of Christ, as the brotherhood, that is the family. In Ephesians uh, chapter 5, at verse 22, beginning, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. He used the marriage relationship and compared that beautiful relationship to the relationship that Christ sustains to his church, his body over which he is head, his bride, with his being the bridegroom. The church was planned church was prophesied, church was promised and prepared and presented on Pentecost with a specific pattern, and it is precious beyond description. That's why a doctrine that says to us that it's plan B, only to last until such time as the Lord will come again, and this time he'll do what he was not able to do the first time, establish a literal earthly kingdom. That doctrine is a pernicious doctrine a doctrine that we need to combat compassionately but without compromise as we exalt the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, because he is the head of that body. God put all things under his Christ's feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. And Ephesians 4, 4, There is one body, one church. It is not a denomination among denominations. It is not simply a non-denominational body. It is that, but it is more specifically the pre-denominational body of believers. The pre-denominational body that existed long before any denomination, built by man and following the creeds and traditions of man, was ever established. And it's to that pre-denominational body that we need to lead people to by our lives and by our lips as we do all we can to protect her and to propagate the gospel concerning the church. I appreciate your good attention. Look forward to our future times together this week.